Hello, I'm Simon Owens, and you're listening to The Business of Content, a podcast about how publishers create, distribute, and monetize their digital content. For this week's episode, I interviewed the guy who built the BuzzFeed and New Yorker newsletter strategies from the ground up. Dan Ochinski didn't apply for an open position to run BuzzFeed's newsletter operations. He just happened to reach out to editor Ben Smith back when BuzzFeed was hiring a bunch of people with weird internet obsessions, and the company hired him without a clearly defined role. This dynamic granted Dan a lot of leeway in terms of how he approached BuzzFeed's newsletters, and he went on to launch several products, including multiple online courses and the newsletter This Week in Cats. A few years later, he got hired to run newsletters at The New Yorker, which was focused on building out its paid digital subscriptions. Recently, he left that job to run his own newsletter consultancy. I recently interviewed Dan about how he built out BuzzFeed's newsletter strategy, the role of newsletters in driving paid subscriptions, and why he left such a prestigious job to strike off on his own. Before we jump into the interview, I want to tell you about a case study I published recently. I interviewed Jacqueline Schiff about an agency she runs that specializes in converting podcast episodes into viral articles. We discussed how she goes about converting a podcast episode into an article and the role these articles play in growing a podcaster's audience. To access this case study and more like it, you have to become a paying subscriber to my Substack. I don't carry advertising on this podcast, so subscribing to my Substack is the only way to support all the work I do to help you in your career. To subscribe, go to simonowens.substack.com. That's simonowens.substack.com. Or you can just Google the words Simon Owens and newsletter. Okay, on to my interview with Dan. Hey, Dan, thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. So we're here to talk about all the interesting stuff that you've done with newsletters. But first, like, how did you first get interested in the newsletter space itself? So my very first newsletter was product called Tools for Reporters, which I started back in 2012. And it was what you think it, what it sounds like is what it was. It was tools that reporters could use. I was working on this project called Story.us, and we were testing out all sorts of different tools and apps and tricks and decided that there would be, there should be a place for us to share what we kind of learned and, and, and what had worked for us. So I built it and it grew a little audience. And what had always intrigued me about the audience was it allowed me in a really direct way to start conversations. I loved that people could reply to the emails and ask questions or share their own tools. And that engagement was so interesting, which was just so interesting to me. And that's really where I came from. It was this idea that email is this tool where you can build a relationship with the audience, where you can share things, it drives pretty consistent results, but the conversations that you can have there can be really powerful. And it's interesting because all these years later, the thing that I still find most amazing about email, the ability to really have a, a consistent relationship with the audience, to start conversations, to listen and learn, the stuff that I value now is the stuff that I valued back then. Email hasn't changed all that much. It's still such a powerful tool. And around what year were you running the Tools for Reporters? So I ran Tools, Tools for Reporters 2012 to 2014 or so. And it's still going. Uh, a few Mizzou grads, a few, a few years younger than me, took it over and have done an amazing job. Turned the newsletter that had a few hundred subscribers into a newsletter that now has a few thousand. It's, it's doing great. But they really picked up the baton and ran with it. Uh, and But it was, it was a fun experiment for a few years as it got going. At a certain point, I just had too much going on with my day job to do this side product as well. But it was the one that got me into this news into the newsletter space and showed me how much potential there was. And even though it was kind of like a side hustle, you know, hobby type of thing, it got the attention of BuzzFeed in some way, right? Like how did, how did your job at BuzzFeed running their newsletters come about? Yeah, totally by accident. In 2012, BuzzFeed tended to hire folks who had weird internet projects. And I had a pretty big one with Story.us, actually. We were this uh, long-form journalism outlet based in Springfield, Missouri, covering big issues related to the 2012 election. 
and we'd done some events and we'd put out eBooks through Kindles. Uh, uh, there was actually a small newsletter tied to that as well. And we were also one of the first sites in the country that had a, a responsibly designed website. Everybody does this now, but in 2012, we were one of the first to do so. And so we had a just kind of a, an interesting and unusual sort of platform. And, and BuzzFeed was getting into the long form space and because I had been doing a lot of stuff with long form. I had just reached out to say hi and see what they were you know, doing, what they were interested in. And we started talking, you know, started talking and BuzzFeed really, like I said, tended to hire people with strange internet side projects. If you had a weird Tumblr, if you had an Instagram, if you had a podcast or a site like mine, well, people who tend to create interesting things on the internet tended to be good people who worked at BuzzFeed. And so we started talking about how I could help them, where the opportunity might be. And I kept coming back to email for two reasons. One, BuzzFeed was all about telling stories that we wanted people to share, and email is the original source of sharing. And the second is that Jonah Peretti, the founder of BuzzFeed, had himself a little bit of an, uh, an email story because uh, earlier in the 2000s, he had created a, a viral email around a pair of Nike shoes with the word sweatshop written on the bottom of them. So it, it just felt really... It, it felt really natural. And luckily BuzzFeed agreed and, and brought me on to help build out an email program there. Did you have to lay out like a specific newsletter strategy before being hired? Or did you, did, <laughs> did like Ben Smith hire you with the idea that you'd figure it out? Very much the latter. So to give you a sense, one of my, my very first day at the office, uh, uh, one of our, our folks on the engineering team who was one of our earliest employees at BuzzFeed uh, brought me over to my desk and in a very general sort of way asked, do you know what you're supposed to be doing? And he meant it in like a, do you know what you're doing the rest of the day? I have other stuff to worry about. Like, can I leave you here? Is it okay? And I took it in the very existential, like, do you know what you're supposed <laughs> to be doing? No, <laughs> no, not at all. I was kind of hoping BuzzFeed would have this magic playbook that they would just open up and go, oh, page 37, that's the email guide that you guys, you know, you could, you'll work off of, Dan. I was kind of hoping that this would be a, you know, color in between the lines kind of thing. And instead it was, no, let's figure this out together. And that was fun because there was no playbook. There were no rules. We had no real strategy in mind other than let's make stuff that's going to be useful, stuff that people we know and like will get a lot of value from. Let's make stuff that surprises and delights people. Those are really the only things we cared about. I, I, I went, I was looking at it the other day, actually. I found these slides that I had kind of prepared before my first days at BuzzFeed to talk me, to think mentally through what we were going to do, what our values were. And it was around utility. It was around providing a service to readers. And it was around being surprising and delighting. That was really it. Everything else, we just kind of tried to chase what was working, what wasn't, and go from there. You got hired to do new newsletters when Facebook was still the dominant force in web publishing, and that was especially true for BuzzFeed. Um, but do you think BuzzFeed caught on earlier than most outlets that Facebook traffic wouldn't last? Like that, like at some point they would take away all this this free distribution. So we were very aware of the fact that Facebook owned the audience, and at the end of the day, something that uh, a former uh, BuzzFeed colleague, colleague of mine, Jonathan Perlman, used to say, content is king, but distribution is queen, and she wears the pants. <laughs> and for us, that meant, let's try to make sure we have as many channels that we own and operate as we can. That meant email, that meant podcast, and meant having a really big app audience. Uh, where are the places that we can go to reach people that we, we know we can get to them, where there isn't an algorithm, where there isn't another gatekeeper involved? Facebook, though, was such an important driver of traffic to BuzzFeed. It was unavoidable. So we needed them to grow. And at least my goal on the email team, I don't want to speak for the, all of BuzzFeed.com, but our goal on the email team was let's get as many of these readers as we can who are coming from social and turn them into a newsletter audience where we know that we have a chance to reach them, where we know we can build a relationship. And what kind of newsletter projects did you launch at BuzzFeed? 
So my first day at BuzzFeed, I pitched three newsletters, a daily newsletter, a long form newsletter, and a newsletter called This Week in Cats. And everyone thought the latter was a joke. And then we built it into a really big loyal audience because people identify as cat folks on the, you know, people identify as cat people on the internet. And so a weekly newsletter where we tell you what's happening in the world of cats. Yeah, people wanted that. Um, but the idea over time was to figure out, like I said, what was working, what, what, what wasn't, and lean into certain things. So we discovered pretty early on that newsletters around lifestyle content, food, DIY in particular, were good. Over time, we launched newsletters around health and beauty, uh, and we launched a whole line of courses, which were these automated newsletters, where we were going to teach you a new skill, a habit, a trick, a lesson, something over the course of a couple of days. And whether you signed up today, tomorrow, or a couple of years in the future, you'd get these series of emails. So those were ones like the seven day better skin challenge. We did a couch to 5k program, a uh, spring cleaning program. These worked incredibly well. And they just came out of our natural sort of curiosity, curiosity where we saw we saw these opportunities where our DIY program is working well. What else could we do in this lane? How else could we serve readers? How else could we build products that might allow us to onboard and welcome new readers into our newsletter world? So we launched those. We launched a lot of stuff around, uh, around news. Uh, and we launched some personality-driven newsletters. And, and then quite a few newsletters in other languages. Some of the courses got translated into other languages. German, French, Portuguese, Japanese. Uh, we launched unique products in other languages too. And then that was fun with Buzzfeed. It was such a, there was so much room to play in this, this sandbox that we had built. And all of us were just trying to figure out how we could build a better version of the internet, a version of the internet that we all wanted to, to live on and, and, and experience. And it was fun to work in a place where, there were no rules other than to make something that was going to be great and useful and surprising and entertaining for our readers. How were you capturing new email subscribers? Like, was it just like forms embedded within the articles or were they forwarding them to each other or how was that working? So we had this enormous traffic spigot coming to us because of Facebook and Google in particular. And it was just our job to try to, to capture as many email addresses as we could. Think the example of the, if you've ever been to uh, like a carnival where they have one of those booths where they shoot money up into the air and you're just trying to grab and cap, you know, that was kind of what it was at BuzzFeed. Uh, there was so much traffic. How do we, how do we get it all? And we were building out the right technology to actually do this. I think something that was, it's really important to remember is when I got started at BuzzFeed, most news organizations weren't investing in email in any way. So I spent a lot of time my first year trying to find others who basically had the job that I did. And it didn't really exist at most news organizations. This was maybe part of somebody's job or the newsletter strategy was one where it's, well, we have some RSS feed based newsletters that we send out, but we don't really put any attention into those. All our attention is going into Google or Facebook or whatever yeah, these organizations. Or the social are media, it was part of the social media editor's job. A lot of sure, times. exactly. It's somebody who this was 2% of their job or 5% of their job. It was very rare to find people who had my job. And so we didn't have a lot of great examples to work off of. We had to sort of build it ourselves. And, and that was fun and challenging in a way too. So a lot of what we did was trying something and then figuring out if it worked, what's the next evolution of it? So it'd be stuff like, I remember the first time that we had to build an audience that there wasn't a, a, like a vertical or a section tied to. We launched a newsletter back in the day about the royal baby, back when George was, I think he's now like six or seven years old, but back in the day before he was born, we thought, oh, we could do something fun. Let's launch a royal baby newsletter. It'll be a news alert. Well, you'll be the first to know when the royal baby is born. And then we had to figure out how to get readers for this thing because there wasn't, you know, a royal baby section where we could just throw a, a sign up box uh, at the bottom of a post. So we started doing some, some inline calls to action and just be a line of text that said, you know, are you interested in finding out when the royal baby will be born? 
or want to be the first to know when the royal baby is born, sign up for BuzzFeed's royal baby newsletter. And then we would link out to a sign up page. And those worked really well. So we got curious and went, oh, this is good. Well, could we build a more advanced version of this? All right, let's work with our team and figure out how to build sign up boxes directly into the into the uh, into certain stories. Oh, let's figure out what else we can do. Oh, you know, we have all this additional ad inventory that we're not using. BuzzFeed wasn't doing programmatic at the time. Sometimes we had additional space. Let's run house ads there. Oh, that worked well. Uh, let's build out a better newsletter page. Let's test out things on social. Uh, let's build pages designed for search purposes. A lot of what we were doing was just kind of tinkering and trying until we landed on stuff that worked. At the time, BuzzFeed was strongly against anything that would impact the user experience. We didn't do any sorts of pop-ups. Um, that's changed. The BuzzFeed will do these, these small kind of uh, toaster units that pop up from the bottom of the screen. Uh, but that also kind of drilled in me that, you know, no matter what you're doing with the email capture, the reading, the reading experience, the user experience has to come first. There's no sign-up box that is so good that I would trade, um, you know, I would never put my a reader in a position where they have to make a choice between, well, you know, do I want to click through all these different things to, to X out of a newsletter sign-up window or do I want to read a story? Like, we should put the reading experience first. Optimizing for conversions is important, but make sure that readers can actually read your stories because the stories are the best source of new signups, the best source of loyal readers. Even to this day, I still think about that sort of stuff because of what BuzzFeed taught me. We're seeing a lot of publishers that are hiring like newsletter editors who's who are kind of like have their own star power and it's their their, their job to create original content for newsletters. Like Bloomberg has definitely leaned, has been very forward in this. Like their tech newsletter, they have like an entire column at the beginning of it. Uh, they have Matt Le Levine, I think that's how you, Matt Levine, uh, who has his own like just standalone uh, newsletter. The New York Times just hired an anchor, quote unquote, for its daily newsletter. Like, were, were you at BuzzFeed, were you guys creating a lot of original content within the newsletter itself? Or or were you linking out to kind of BuzzFeed content elsewhere, whether it was on the website or, or YouTube? It was a mix. Certain newsletters, uh, This Week in Cats newsletter is actually a great example. Those were destination products. The entire reading experience really took place in the inbox. And we made a lot of those. All the courses were products where we were bringing original stuff to you in your inbox. We launched some personality-driven newsletters. The, uh, the BuzzFeed news team created an amazing news newsletter that was a really early daily news briefing that did really well. And that was, let's bring our best stuff to you in the inbox. So there was plenty of that back then. It's exciting to see more publishers move into this space. Frankly, when we were doing this at BuzzFeed back in... 2012, 2013, 2014, 2015, I kept waiting for other publishers to realize that this was a huge opportunity for them and to invest. And it's really only been in the last few years that I've seen the, the biggest publishers in this space make a huge investment in email. And it's because the data has proved that email is really the number one way that you take a casual reader and turn them into a paying subscriber. It's also the best way to build habit and reduce churn. And as more businesses, more news businesses are thinking about being subscriber first, member first, donor first, well, email is the channel that gets you there. And so the revenue side of things has really push the industry forward and, and brought about a lot of these changes for the better. Because if you looked at what some of these big publishers were doing a few years ago on email, they really weren't investing in the products. There wasn't a strategy from, uh, you know, certain organizations, you might have an editor or a writer who had their own newsletter and they would invest their time in it, but you weren't seeing a consistent style uh, consistent design, consistent strategy being applied across these channels. It took a while to get there. I'm not surprised that organizations have gotten there, though, because it's just so useful and so powerful. 
I, I noticed that like the the way these newsletters are crafted is a very kind of casual way of writing. Like if you publish a column to like an actual official column at like Bloomberg, it's you know very well polished and everything like that. Um, whereas like the stuff that they're publishing or not just at Bloomberg but others is very kind of conversational. What's kind of the what's the motivation behind that? Do you think? So the inbox itself is very much a living room. It's this personal space where a reader allows, uh, you know, uh, their family, their friends, their colleagues, and maybe a couple brands or news organizations in, but it's their space. And I think a lot of the tone has come out of brands realizing that we need to talk to them in a way that makes sense for that space. The living room demands a, just a, a slightly different type of conversation and tone. And it can be a little more personal and it can be a little more intimate, which I think is great. Uh, historically, news organizations have really kept up a standard sort of voice that they, you know, a consistent voice that they use. And in email, I'm seeing more news organizations let their guard down a little bit and be a little more casual and be a little more intimate, which is, which is really good. The other thing that I think has been helpful, there's two things. One is a lot more personal newsletters. Uh, Tiny Letter was the first really to push the space forward, but lately tools like Substack have made it so that a lot more folks are subscribing to personal newsletters and they're really powerful. And I think uh, news organizations are starting to try to mimic that tone the other thing is the growth of podcasts as the New York Times is a great example with the growth of something like The Daily and the way that people have a relationship with Michael Barbaro. Well, that's led them to think about how do we translate this sort of thing for email. And the more that these news organizations think about utilizing their personalities and their voices, I think the better they will do in the long run. Was BuzzFeed selling advertising within the newsletters? Yeah, we were. There was a lot of room for growth there as we were we, we were getting going. Um, something to remember too about BuzzFeed is BuzzFeed was still very much building out a revenue strategy when I was there. It was all sponsored content when I started. Over time, it shifted towards affiliate, which we started to, to utilize in newsletters. Uh, It shifted towards now programmatic. Uh, It shifted towards sales of of products and events. So there was a lot of room on the monetization side. And we did quite a bit of it when I was there. I'm not going to tell you that the newsletter products were this incredible revenue driver for BuzzFeed. They weren't, but they drove a little bit of revenue. uh, So like, how good do you think the media is at selling advertisers and advertising in newsletters? Like my sense is it's still very ad hoc and difficult to scale at most news outlets like they they might dabble in it but they don't seem to have like a very strong system in place yeah most news organizations in terms of advertising itself most are still thinking about programmatic advertising and newsletters which is fine and generates a little bit of revenue but i think a lot of the brands that do this leave money on the table um actually i'll amend that statement I know a lot of the brands that are just doing programmatic are leaving money on the table. There are, interestingly, a lot of opportunities in native advertisements, which was the type of stuff we were doing at BuzzFeed. Those can do really well. And if you look at some email-first types of brands, uh, like Morning Brew or The Skim or 6AM City, you'll see some really good examples out there. Uh, There's also a huge opportunity in terms of affiliate content as well right now. And when you see... We did quite a bit of this at BuzzFeed and other brands like the wire cutter that have invested in email in really smart ways. Um, there's just, a, there's a lot of opportunities. I think most news organizations actually as a result of this pandemic, a lot of them, a lot of the conversations I've had the past few months have been around email advertising because what people are realizing is it's a, fairly consistent and fairly loyal audience. And in tough times, advertisers start thinking about the return on their investment. They want to know that if they put some money in, that they're going to get a guaranteed return out. And they want to be able to track 
the performance and success of the campaigns they're running. And email tends to, to drive really good results at a relatively low cost. It's a, just a useful channel for advertisers. And so I'm starting to see a lot more of the organizations that I work with and talk with saying, are we monetizing our newsletters the way we should be? Because of the things that are, that are actually growing in the ad world, email ad revenue hasn't really slowed down the last few months even while other parts of the ad world have seen big cutbacks uh, in terms of social or programmatic. I mean, do you think part of it is just the same problem the, the podcast industry is having and uh, where there's no good centralized place to purchase newsletter advertising, so it has to be on such a case-by-case -case basis, and that's one of the challenges they have? I think that's certainly part of it. There are some tools that are coming up right now that are really useful for selling ad placements and newsletters. Um, and as those grow and are more widely adopted and we get away from some of the, not to say the programmatic can't be part of the equation, I think it can be, but I think that as more of these tools get adopted, there are are going to be some interesting opportunities to drive revenue here. You know, it, it, there's the chicken or the egg thing is the issue that the newsletter landscape wasn't mature enough to support advertising is the issue that the advertising landscape wasn't mature enough to support newsletters. I think it's a little bit of both. You later went to run newsletters for the New Yorker. How did that role differ from your work at BuzzFeed? A lot less cats, just significantly <laughs> fewer cats. Uh, at, the New Yorker, what was funny about the, the, the shift was when I first did it, a lot of folks that I knew were like, oh, this must be a total 180. It was and it wasn't. You know, BuzzFeed was news, culture, humor, entertainment, and so is the New Yorker. Obviously, what the New Yorker is doing is on a slightly different level for a slightly different audience. But some of the basic building blocks were still there. When I got to The New Yorker, what had happened was The New Yorker had realized through some analysis of its own data that the best way they took casual readers and turned them into paying subscribers was through their email program. And they didn't have anyone in charge of newsletters. So, And Condé Nast had never hired a person to oversee newsletters for a specific brand. They'd never done that in their history. And so... I came on board to figure out what does this job look like? Um, how does it work in terms of coordinating between all the different parts of not just the New Yorker, but also Condé Nast, building out the right types of emails, figuring out how we grow the list, working with our consumer revenue business to figure out how we were going to do an even better job of turning these readers into paying subscribers, figuring out how we were going to use email to retain uh, our audience, our paying audience. There was just a lot to figure out when I got there. And in terms of like, it, it, I've read several case studies at this point about The New Yorker and how successful it, it, it really saw newsletters as a huge way to drive subscribers. Like they were just much more likely to turn into paying subscribers if they were a regular reader of the newsletter. Was that, you know, was that the biggest driver you were seeing in terms of the motivation behind growing their newsletters? And and was that true that you you saw that uh, you, within the analytics that you were seeing a very high, much higher conversion and retention rate for newsletter subscribers? Yeah, so the, the data proved out that this was the best way that we were going to take casual readers and turn them into new paying subscribers. The email audience was so important. And... It also, so there were, there were two factors. One was subscriptions and being a driver of that. Um, the second was traffic to the site. The New Yorker, like a lot of brands, really got serious in the last couple of years about thinking about this owned and operated audience. Who is the audience that we know we can reach and have a relationship with and trying to diversify beyond just social and search. And newsletter was a huge part of that. There was also a big push uh, on the app side of things, a big push on podcasts, all of which were part of this desire to have stronger relationships with the New Yorker audience. And I guess there was a third thing too, which is thinking about 
other sorts of sorts of revenue, and that meant uh, it meant advertising, it meant events. The New Yorker Festival, in particular, the New Yorker has a pretty robust store where you can buy merchandise and prints. That was certainly part of it. But the thing about email that, that makes it so powerful uh, at an organization like Conde, they talk a lot about this idea of cross-functional teams. We want folks in the room. Uh, we want to put folks from different parts of the organization, editorial and sales and consumer revenue and product and data. We want to put them in the room to work together instead of just working in the silos the way that you know, many of these organizations had been built. Email is really the cross-functional tool. If you work in the editorial team, the sales team, audience development, product, data, consumer revenue, well, email had an impact on your job and on your, you know, on, on the performance of the things that you cared about. And it just made it a, an unusually valuable tool for us. And because of the success there, they just continued to, and have continued even since I've left, continued to invest in it and build products that work for email because the return is there. Were they trying to create synergies between you and the teams at like GQ, Vanity Fair and, you know, Vogue and stuff like that? Like, were you trying to cross promote and then get them to help you cross promote content? Or was there any kind of coordination like that? Because obviously there's a lot of Cadde Nass is a huge company where there could be some synergy between the different players. Yeah, the teams that I worked most closely with otherwise Wired, Self and GQ. And those were teams that were also investing in a big way in email. And there was some cross promotion that happened, but a bigger thing was thinking about sharing lessons across different parts of the org. So that way, you know, we at the New Yorker could work on new products and GQ could try their experiments with affiliate content and Wired was trying experiments in terms of audience development. And the goal was to get to a place they're still working towards this where all parts of the organization can be testing and learning and trying things and then sharing those learnings back to try to make everybody else in the building smarter and improve everybody else's products. Tell me about the launch of Not A Newsletter. Why, why did you create it? So it's funny that, and I realized this the other day, Not A Newsletter in a lot of ways it's pretty similar to what my very first newsletter was, Tools for Reporters. It came out of this desire to share what I was learning with a larger audience. Not a newsletter in particular. What I realized is I kept getting the same questions over and over again from others in the industry. Someone would uh, hire their very first newsletter editor, and then I would get an email from that person, hi, I'm so-and-so, I just got hired at this place. I have this new job and we have no idea what this job looks like. Can we talk? Because they were going through the thing that I had gone through all these years earlier at BuzzFeed. And I kept having similar conversations around growth and what are the right strategies and realized that I should just document it somewhere. I had learned a lot about what worked and what didn't. It just seemed to make sense to me that there should be a place that I could share what I was learning with this audience. So when I launched Not A Newsletter, I thought about it. One is it was just going to be a little experiment. I launched it as a Google Doc because I just wanted to give people, uh, I just wanted to give myself an easy way to, to get it out there into the world. I had launched a couple months earlier. I'd given a talk at an, uh, an O&A event in New York about ways to grow your newsletter list. And every couple months I would share it with somebody and always notice that there were always like 12 anonymous armadillos hanging out yeah. in the Google Doc. It's like, huh, I gave this talk six months ago to an audience of 100 people. There's still people reading this. Like that always struck me as interesting. And there were some of their friends in the industry who had tried some stuff with Google Docs that stuck out to me. And I just had a sense that Google Docs would be a good way to, for people to share things that were work related. It's how we did things at Conde. You have an idea, you have some, you know, a slide deck, put it into Google Docs or Google Slides and share it around. So it just seemed to make sense to me that way. But when I built it, it was just with a, a news 
specific audience in mind. I, I told my wife when I launched it back in 20, uh, in 2019, in January, 2019, you know, I was going to have the Google doc. And then I created a, at first it was just a tiny letter, sign up to be alerted when I publish the next one of these. And I told my wife that if 10 people signed up, if 10 people signed up before the end of the month, that I would do a second one. And a couple days later, 500 people had signed up and it became pretty clear that there was an audience for this that was bigger than I had realized. And there was a need for this. Uh, most of the blogs and most of the email related content is really marketing focused. There wasn't a lot about what I was seeing, which was how do you build an audience? How do you develop loyalty? How do you grow an audience? How do you think about subscription strategies for newsletters uh, and converting an, a newsletter audience to paid? And I just wanted to build a space that could talk to folks like me who needed help. It, it also just seemed kind of weird and quirky that it was a Google Doc. Like it, it almost made you want to sign up more because you're like, why is this guy putting this weird thing in a Google Doc instead of doing a standard MailChimp or, or something like that? I think I want to sign up and see what this is all about. Yeah, a little bit. It, it definitely stuck out to some folks as a, as a weird little experiment because there hadn't been that many of these that had been public yet. And... I liked that about it too. I still like it. It's the reason that I keep it as a Google Doc. It, one of the reasons, at least, is people tend to tell their friends, you should read this guy's thoughts on email. He puts them into a Google Doc every month. And then they go and they'll see, you know, 75 anonymous koalas hanging out in a Google Doc. And they'll go like, what is this? <laughs> um, it's just not the usual format or structure. And so that sticks out that honestly, the fact that it's unusual is a good thing. I personally am used to kind of sticking out. I'm six, five. So I've always been somebody who kind of sticks out a little bit. And so it made sense that, you know, I stick out in life. I guess my, <laughs> where I write should stick out as well. Really though, it's just a blog that I write once a month. It just happens to be published as a Google doc. It, but it's also almost antithetical. I, I doubt you would ever advise any of your clients to do it because it, you don't get SEO benefits out of it. It doesn't oh, no. spread as I would well. never advise someone to do this. <laughs> I would never advise some. It's great for small communities. If you are giving a talk or if you have a small group of folks who are trying to share stuff, Google Docs are great for this. But I would never advise someone to to go out and launch an entire website based on a Google Doc because, as you mentioned, there's no SEO value. None whatsoever. You, I mean, there. I have blog posts that I've written on my personal site that point towards not a newsletter, but otherwise, it's kind of fun. It's it's like a it's a little bit of a secret. You have to know it's there in order to find it, or someone has to. You can't really search for it, which means the people who find it are referred by a friend, or they're referred from. They saw me give a talk or they read an article where it got linked, like someone has to point you there. It makes it a little bit of a secret. And it also, and this is something that I didn't really appreciate until a couple months into, after leaving the New Yorker, when I started Inbox Collective and started doing consulting is, it, it, this is the number one way that I get new clients but Inbox Collective is a one-person operation. It's me. And I can only do 74 or 75 things at one time. And so there's a limit to how much bandwidth I have over the course of a day or a week. And in a way, the fact that it's restricted means that the Google Doc can only grow so fast in terms of audience, which means I can... In a way, I, there's a restriction on how many like new conversations I can have every single month on new people who are reaching out about client work. It's basically a restrictor plate that I've put on to this thing that allows me to grow my business in a way that I can actually maintain. My biggest fear, frankly, would be what if suddenly, what if suddenly I doubled the size? Right now, there's 4,000 people who've signed up to get an email alert when I publish the new edition of Not a Newsletter. If the audience doubled overnight, I don't know what I would do. I don't know how I would handle it. <laughs> so in a way, this has allowed me to also 
grow my business and grow the audience at a pace that is manageable for me. But it's definitely not for everybody. Uh, I would never recommend to one of my clients to use Google Docs as their publishing platform. It doesn't work on mobile. It has no SEO benefits whatsoever. Um, There's a lot that it doesn't do. That being said, it works just fine for me. (laughs) How how did you decide to leave the New Yorker and hang up your own shingle? By accident. Really, it was an accident. It was a happy accident. And it was because of not a newsletter, which is not a thing that New Yorker folks say. New Yorker staff, these are, I mean, what I'll say about the New Yorker is, Every, a lot of the career advice you'll get is, you know, or people who tell you, you know, you don't want to be the smartest person in the room. You want to be learning from people smarter than you. There was never a doubt when I was at the New Yorker that there were people smarter than me in the room. The New Yorker was an incredibly smart, thoughtful, and amazing place to work. And I was so lucky to be a part of that place for a couple of years and still so proud to have been a small part of the growth of that, of that, of that publication. And what had happened was not a newsletter started to grow. And as it grew and scaled, I started getting these email replies to the Google Doc in my inbox. And folks at other news organizations would say, you know, we're, we're starting to make an investment in email. And we're trying to figure out what the next step is. And we have this money budgeted for someone to help us figure out the strategy. We don't have the right folks in-house. We need to work with somebody outside help us figure things out. Do you know who that person is? And I kept writing back and saying, oh man, that person should really exist. It'd be really great if that person existed. I'm sorry that I don't know who that person is. And after the 10th, 12th, 15th, whatever it was, email that I got, at some point my wife said, you know, you're the person. It's like, oh, thought the light bulb went off. It's like, oh, oh no, I'm the person, which means if I'm the one who needs to help these folks, I can't do that and do the New Yorker. The New Yorker needs someone full time. And kind of what I decided was I got into the, the New Yorker email program and with a lot of help and uh, just a lot of amazing folks in the room. We'd gotten it to a place where the New Yorker was going to be in good shape. And they were going to be able to continue to grow. I wasn't worried about the New Yorker, but I started to be pretty worried about the rest of the journalism industry and started thinking that there was a big opportunity for me to help a lot of other newsrooms. And so I did an unusual thing and that I left the New Yorker to start a consulting business. It's not the normal track that New Yorker writers go on. New Yorker folks usually go on to work at big media outlets like the New York Times or the Washington Post, or they start their own podcasts, or they write books, uh, they win awards. Uh, I, consulting isn't really one of the things that's on the list. and. It was really a happy accident, though. It was because the audience told me they needed this, that there was a need for help. And so I really, looking back, I I didn't really have a choice. I had to do this. I, I had to go and find a way to help the journalism world. And Inbox Collective came out of that desire to to be a part of the change that I think needs to happen in the journalism industry. And you're not taking on like consumer companies as clients for the most part. You're taking on content, very much content focused media companies. Like that's so you're doing like a sub, a sub, a sub genre within the newsletter email marketing space. Like you're 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 focused on editorial content. Correct. My clients are eighty five percent news clients and about fifteen percent nonprofits, um, who I find actually have very similar challenges and needs to news organizations and like news organizations i think a lot of the the nonprofits that i get to work with do an amazing public good and it's fun to get to learn figure out solutions for them too but yeah that's where my attention is i'm you know i'm not advising uh, uh, big brands right now on on how to do this i'm trying to help news organizations and nonprofits because that's where i think the most that's where i think i can do the most good what does your typical engagement look like? Like, what are they specifically hiring you to do? Like, are you just coming up with a strategy and handing it off to them? Or are you, you know, playing any kind of day-to-day role? So when I was at the New Yorker, right when I got there, there was 
a really big consulting firm that was doing this big project with the New Yorker. And what I saw shaped the way I think about Inbox Collective, which was they came and I don't know how much money we spent on it, but we spent a, probably a fair bit of money to work with these guys. And they came back with all this research and the strategy and they handed it over to us. And then that was kind of it. Um, it was really up to us to do the work, which meant that it didn't really get done the way that it had been laid out in these strategy decks. Um, and I never wanted, with Inbox Collective, my fear was, I don't want to be somebody who comes in and just tells you what to do and isn't part of helping you actually make the change. Anything that I do, I need to be there to actually continue to support you. All the fun stuff happens from the doing, and all the good stuff happens from actually going out and being a part of doing the work. So all of the engagements that I do have... I prioritize working with teams where I can continue to help. Now, that could mean I do a lot of work with uh, local news organizations, nonprofit news organizations, nonprofits too, where I do coaching, where we'll set up a series of coaching calls over the course of three, six, 12 months. Um, and we'll do, be doing regular calls, you know, come up with the strategy. And then over the course of a couple months, actually put the strategy into play and, and I'm there to help support them and advise them and help them overcome roadblocks and, and figure things out as they go along. Those are really fun. Um, I do a lot of project work over a period of a couple of weeks or months where we're taking on specific things and, and trying to, to move things forward. Even when I do, you know, in the, uh, in the before times when people still met in offices, I did a lot of email workshops where I'd go to an office and I would do an audit of somebody's email program and we'd get, get everybody on the bus and get them excited about email strategy. Even then there were always calls and follow-ups built in because I wanted to make sure that as teams went along, they had a chance to keep figuring out and keep talking through the next steps and, and working through the, the logistics and the obstacles they were going to run into. Otherwise, you know, for me, I, I like being there to support them because I know they're going to run into stuff along the way. We don't always know what it's going to be, but I know they're going to run into obstacles. And when they do, I want to be there to actually continue to support them and help them. Uh, and so all the engagements that I do, I prioritize. It's about the relationship. Um, and I would rather do a longer term engagement that drives a little bit less revenue for my business then do a shorter term engagement where it's tell us the strategy and drop it off on our desk and we're good here. We've gotten what we need out of you. Now that the industry is taking newsletters very seriously and, and we're seeing them just launch new ones left and right, uh, do you think we're going to like reach any kind of saturation point like where publishers start seeing lower ROIs either in it being a lot harder to actually acquire new newsletter subscribers or new subscribers signing up and then just falling off much more quickly in terms of like opening them on a regular basis? I think there is some validity, validity to that. And here's where my worry is. My worry is for publishers who aren't investing yet in creating amazing experiences for email. If you're investing in email, but you're still pushing out uh, strategies that you would have done five, 10 years ago. Here's just a reverse cron feed of our recent stories. There's no personality. If they're not investing in onboarding re readers the right way, if they're not thinking about relationships, about engaging with readers, asking them for feedback, using that reply button in the inbox, uh, if they're not thinking about lots of different growth strategies, yeah, there is some risk that they're that there's going to be issues in the long run. I don't worry about the idea of this like peak newsletter too much because from a reader's perspective, you know, the inbox is their space and they will decide how much they want and what they want. It's really up to us, uh, you know, anyone who produces a newsletter to make stuff that is so good that it demands space in your inbox, that it earns your place in the inbox and that you keep the place there. The publishers that tend to struggle are the ones they dip their toe in, they launch an automated feed, it doesn't work, this didn't work, and then they just say email doesn't work. Well, that's fine. Um, but they haven't really invested the way they should. There's so much room for growth here. 
There's actually a new report out just this month from Reuters. They do their annual 2020 digital report, and they said something that stuck out to me. They referred to the they referred to email as unsophisticated. It's not a very sophisticated piece of technology, which isn't true. Many publishers aren't using it in, in, to the level of sophistication they should be in terms of building out really great products, thinking about how you grow your list in interesting ways, investing uh, in the, the tools, the resources, and most importantly, the, the humans and personnel to produce great newsletters. They're not thinking about automation or, automation or personalization, but you know, it's a pretty sophisticated tool, it's just not necessarily being used in that way. It's also, I think, deceptively simple as well. That's the other thing. Everyone uses email, so they assume that they know everything about email. Um, they assume that it must not be that hard to do. It's hard to do well. Um, but when you do it well, you can you can do a pretty amazing things with it. I don't worry about the idea of peak newsletter, though, just because at the end of the day, it's up to us to earn our place. And the ones who don't should be taking a step back and thinking about, you know, I don't think it's a matter of the readers. I think it's on us to do a better job, to produce amazing things that are useful, that provide a service, that provide value, that introduce amazing personalities to the inbox. It's up to us to do that job and earn our space there. Okay, Dan. Well, those were all the questions I had for you. Where can people find you online? So they can find uh, Not A Newsletter at notanewsletter.com. It'll redirect you to the Google Doc. Inbox Collective, uh, my consulting business, is at inboxcollective.com. And... Naturally, that will take you to a set of Google Slides because why not? Uh, just keep it all on brand. And if you want to read weekly blog musings, I do that at danoshinsky.com. Okay. Well, thanks. This is a lot of fun. Thanks for having me. Okay. Thanks for joining us. I'm actually on the lookout for new guests for this podcast. So if you do interesting stuff in digital content, whether you're a full-time YouTuber, a media executive, or run a cool niche newsletter, definitely reach out. My email address is simonowens at gmail.com. Okay. See you next week.